بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى today we're gonna hopefully إن شاء الله تعالى go through the تفسير وصورة الفاتحة the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha and the tafsir that I've chosen to bring with me is the Mukhtasar tafsir of Qurtubi the abrad tafsir of Imam Al-Qurtubi has anyone heard of Imam Al-Qurtubi before? where is he from? Uh, pardon me? Qurtubi al Andalus. 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 Spain. 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 Spain so Andalus is Spain so, and, so he was a of Quran and obviously, for those who don't know, Al Andalus used to be under Muslim control, it was a Muslim country for 700 odd years. 700 years. Uh, 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 um, uh, uh, Andalus was under, was a Muslim country until obviously, uh, you know, uh, 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 Christian forces obviously took over and obviously turned it back into what it is today in terms of modern day Spain. I think in the year 1491 or something like that. Um, uh, uh, King Ferdinand and Isabella took over. But prior to that, there's many ulama that came out of that came out of Andalus, which came out of Spain. So you have ulama such as um, Ibn Abd al Bar al Andalusi, great scholar of Hadith. You have Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al Arabi, another great scholar of, of, of Quran. You have Imam al Shatibi from Shatib. So you have many ulama that came from Spain, and they were Malikis. They were of the Maliki. Maliki school of thought. Maliki school of thought is a school of thought that's prevalent in North Africa and West Africa. So anyone that you see that's from West Africa is of Maliki, is of Maliki, uh, what do you call it, is of Maliki um, uh, um, um, origin basically. North and West Africa, all the way into a Sudan. So from Sudan to Senegal uh, uh, and all the other West African countries in North Africa, they all follow the, 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 the Maliki method. And prior to that, so was Spain. Spain was upon the tariqa of, of the, they were upon the Maliki uh, uh, fiqh. Uh, they followed the fiqh of Imam Malik. Imam Malik fiqh spread to North Africa. So, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to start uh, reading, inshallah ta'ala, from this tafsir in order to understand Al-Fatiha. Because Fatiha is the first, is the first, is the first, uh, what do you call it? It's the first thing we recite, or the first piece of Quran we recite when it comes to when it comes to reciting the salawat of khams, the five daily prayers, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Bunya al-Islam wa ala khams, and Islam is built upon fire, the shahada to an la ilaha illallah wa Muhammad rasulullah. So the shahada to say that there's no God worthy of worship except Allah, but Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger. And then he said, wa iqam is salah, to establish the prayer. So uh, we have to, and we have to obviously, so, so the fatiha is, is the first, is the first, uh, what do you call it, is the first thing that we have to, have to recite. For many ulama, uh, you can say even the majority of the scholars for a person who doesn't recite the Quran a Fatiha is, is one of the things that if you leave it in the prayer, your prayer is not considered Sahih okay, if you leave the Salat of Fatiha your prayer is not considered Sahih no, I'm not talking about the ikhtilaf the difference of opinion when praying behind an Imam but for example, if anyone's praying on their own you must recite Surah Al-Fatiha the Prophet Sallallahu said لا صلاة لمن لم يقرأ في كل صلاة بفاتحة الكتاب there's no Salat for anyone who doesn't recite Surah Al-Fatiha. So Surah Al-Fatiha is what we have to, is what we have to recite. So obviously, um, before we start with Surah Al-Fatiha, um, obviously before a person recites Surah Al-Fatiha, then obviously what does a person do before they recite the Quran? They say, they do a ta'awud. And ta'awud is to say, a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ that when you when you're going to read the Quran, then fasta'id billahi min al-shaytan rajim Then make make uh, uh, do a ta'awud, seek refuge from Allah from the shaytan al-rajim. Okay, so this is what we should do uh, before we start the Quran. Uh, uh, we should say a'udhu billahi min al-shaytan rajim And a'udhu when you say a'udhu, you're saying I seek refuge with Allah. Okay, al-a'udhu. Okay. Um, from a shaitan al rajim Okay. Um, now, what does this word shaitan mean? You seek Allah refuge from Allah from the shaitan. The shaitan, the word shaitan comes from the Arabic verb shatana. And shatana means 
someone that's far away from goodness. That's where the word shaitan comes from. So something which is far away from goodness. As for the word ar-rajim, it also means someone that's far, that's casted far away because ar-rajim in, in Arabiya is a ghami to throw, to throw. So the ayah when Allah says, ma ramayta is ramayta wa lakinna Allah ramay. You didn't throw in the day of Badr, it was Allah who threw. When, Allah, when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam threw, uh, what do you call it? Through stones uh, or through, if you like, sand and went into all of the eyes of Quraysh. So, uh, so, 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 so you're making, uh, you're asking Allah to protect you from the shaitan when you recite the Quran. And like we said, Ar-Rajim can mean that person that's cast out, that's been thrown away, thrown away from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is obviously the shaitan. So obviously, as we all know, you know, uh, 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 um, a person will say, will say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Or before they recite the Quran, you will say, Ridhman al-Shaytan al-Rajim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So what does Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim mean? Uh, this ba, we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, a lot of the ulama of the Arabic language, they say that this ba is known as ba al-isti'ana. It's the ba of seeking help, the ba of seeking help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, this word Allah, Bismillah, when we separate and we say this word Allah, what does Allah mean? Okay. Uh, Imam Al Qurtubi he says Allah had al ism, or we can say had al ism, had al ism akbar, akbar wa asma'ihi subhanahu wa ta'ala wa ajma'uha. Okay. Hatta qala ba'du al ulama. He said that this word, uh, 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 Bismillah, is the most comprehensive. This word Allah, sorry, Allah is the most comprehensive of all of the names of Allah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has many names from those names of the 99 names that he's given us and there's other there's more than there's more than 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the most comprehensive of all of them is Allah okay and Allah this word Allah comes from the word from ulama they say it comes from the word al ma'lu that person or al ma'bud that which is worshiped so this is why we say la ilaha illallah there's no good word of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay so naam um, and then after he goes to say, وَقَالَ بَعْضُ الْعُلَمَاءِ إِنَّهُ إِسْمُ اللَّهِ بَعْضًا That indeed that this word Allah is the greatest of all of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of all. وَلَمْ يَتَسَمَّى بِهِ غَيْرُهُ It's so great that you can't call somebody else Allah. It's not permissible. Whereas uh, other names of Allah like Ar-Rahim, Al-Aziz, there is, there's an ikhtilaf on whether or not you can call another person that name. If you add the alif and lam, so you can call someone Aziz, but can you call him Al Aziz? Many ulama have the opinion that you can call him that if the intention is not given him what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has said. So when we say Allah, this is one of those names that it can't be given to nobody else except for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And when we say this word Allah, it has many different even connotations in the Arabic language. Okay, so if Imam Al Qurtubi says about it, for example. المنعوت بنعوت الربوبية المنفرد بوجود المنفرد بالوجود الحقيقي. This even this name Allah it tells us that Allah سبحانه وتعالى he carries the sifa the characteristic of الربوبية meaning that he is the only creator there's no creator لا خالق there's no other creator except for Allah سبحانه وتعالى. So only Allah سبحانه وتعالى is the one who created. This earth and heaven. So when you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are affirming that there is no other creator. Allah, when you say Allah, you're saying the one and truly, the one true God. So then he goes on to say, and we move on to this ayah when we say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. When the person starts shouting the Quran, the, uh, the, 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 the ayah that we say, when we say Surah Al Fatiha, obviously we say, we say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And Alhamdulillah, as Imam Al Qurtubi he says, Walhamdu fi kalam al Arab ma'anahu al thana al kamil. That in the language of the Arabs, Al Hamd is Al thana al kamil. It's for a person to give supreme praise. And when we're talking about Al Arabiya, the language of the Arabs, we're not talking about the Arabs of today. The Arabs of today, they don't, the, their language is not considered to be fasih. It's not considered to be, it's not, لا يحتج باللغة باللغة العرب اليوم. Of the Arabic language, the Arabia that the ulama are talking about is the is the Arabia of the companions, the Prophet and companions, and the people before them. We don't use the Arabia of today because the Arabia of today has changed. 
So for example, if I say to you now, As-salah. If I say to you, salah, you all think of prayer. But salah in the time of the Arabs, it didn't have that meaning. If I say to you now, Az-zakat. Zakat, everyone thinks that it's what you pay at the end of the year. Zakat didn't mean that with the, with the original Arabs that the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam was sent to. It meant, for example, a tizkiyah to, to either pray to yourself or to even purify yourself. So even when it comes back to the linguistic meaning of alhamd, we have to look at the what, how did the people in the time of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, understand it, and how did the pre-Arabians, the pre-Islamic Arabians understand it? Only when we understand what they say can we say that this is what it means. So what alhamd means, as, as he says here, is athana al-kamil, is total praise, is the praise that you're giving sincerely, and the person who is who is deserving, you're giving praise to a person who deserves it, and this kind of praise that you're giving to them is the most, is the highest level of praise that you can give to someone, okay? So for example, um, some people say that alhamd means, another word in Arabic which is similar, and so the similar to the word alhamd is madh, al-madh, madahtuk, I gave you praise, al-madh. Madh means to praise, but there's a difference between al-madh and hamd. Hamd is to sincerely give praise to a person and you know that this person is sincerely is sincerely deserving of this particular praise. As for medh, medhun, medh is different. Medh, you can give praise to someone and not mean it. You can lie. So for example, like a jester in a court in like the Middle Ages, if you have like a jester in the court of the king, you've got the big thing wearing, you know the, those jesters in like the Middle Ages with like the big balls on his head and those things that he's wearing. That, that guy, he's only, selling, he's only saying things, he's praying to the king, so his head doesn't get chopped off in the Middle Ages. So that's madh, that's praising. But alhamd is to give true praise. So when we say alhamdulillah, all praise to Allah, this alif and nam, alhamdulillah is known as al al lil istighraq wal istihqaq. It's the, it's the nam, it's the al which encompasses all praise, and it's the nam of al istihqaq. For us to say that Allah is the only one who who deserves this, okay? So this is what it is, inshaAllah ta'ala, okay? Wa yustahikum hamd bi ajma'ihi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is deserving of all praise. Now why is that? Because see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has al-asma'u al-husna. Allah says, walillahi al-asma'u al-husna. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the greatest names, okay? Wa sifat al-ula. And to Allah is the greatest of all of all sifat, of all characteristics. Okay, so this is why we say alhamd. Also, alhamd, as as, as, Sheikh, uh, as, as, as Imam al Qutbi says, alhamd naqid al dham. Alhamd is the is the opposite of them. Them is to dispraise someone. It's to dispraise, which is why Rabbi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is named Muhammad. What did Quraysh call him? Mudhammam, the person that is dispraised. And then he goes on to say, Alhamdulillahi, okay, Alhamdulillahi, all praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rabbil alameen, then he goes on to say, Rabbil alameen. Rabb here, Rabb can have two meanings in the Arabic language. Rabb can have two meanings. Number one, it can mean Al Malik, the possessor, okay, the Rabb, the possessor, the owner, okay, Al Malik. So he calls someone Malik, okay. So I can say Malaktul Ma or Ana Ana Maliku had al Ma I own this water, I possess it. It's my possession. Okay? Or I can call some or I, or I can say this is my possession. I can also say had an Maluki, this is this is my possession. This is why back in the day uh, there was, a slave was called a Maluk, the person that was, was, was under the milk the, the, the ownership of someone else. So Allah calls himself Maliki Yawmuddin, the, the, the owner, the, the owner of the day of judgment, okay? No, عفواً رب العالمين رب العالمين. Okay, الحمد لله رب العالمين. So رب means مالك owner. Okay, and it also has another meaning. رب can mean تربية to nurture something from the ground up. So Allah سبحانه وتعالى is the one that through Him everyone is nurtured, everyone is sustained. So nobody else has the ability to sustain. Okay, except for Allah سبحانه وتعالى. So this is another thing. So the aqeel of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability to sustain someone else in totality. So for example, when a child grows, yeah, he grows at an, exponent, at, a, at, at an exponential rate. This is true, true Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the Rabb. Okay? So that's what it means. Al-Rabbul Alameen. Alameen. 
Okay, what does alamin mean? Alam, as the ulama say, kullu ma siwa Allahi alam. Everything except from Allah is considered alam. So when you say Allah is Rabbul Alameen, He is Lord of every single thing in creation. That's alam. So this is considered alam. The earth is considered alam. The Jupiter is considered alam. The sun is considered alam. Jannah uh, 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 and, and, and the hellfire and Nar, the aim, everything except for Allah, Allah's throne, the arch, everything is considered alam. So when Allah says Rabbul Alameen, He is the Lord of every single thing in existence. That's alam, okay? That's what alamin it means. Now when it comes to Rabb in Arabic, you can't call someone Rabb. Like again, that's why you said Allah, you can't call some anybody else Allah, you can you can't call anybody else Rabb either. Except for if you're adding that word to something else. In the Arabic language they call it al mudaf al mudaf al ilay when you add another word to another thing. So you can say some if someone owns this uh, uh, let's say there's an owner to this whole entire property complex, you could say Rabbul Arab, the person who owns the the, 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 this, this arm. Or you could say, for example, Rabbul Bayt. Firstly, he's the head, of the, head, the head of the household. You know, the famous line of poetry. If the head of the house is a person who plays the drums, then everybody in the house is going to be a bunch of people that dance. Yeah, and you're trying to say that, that the head of the house has a big mas'ulia, has a big responsibility. So, Rabb, when you attach it to someone else, you can call them Rabbul Bayt, Rabbul Kada. But just to say Rabb, no, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is back to the Lord, the one owner and sustainer of all things, Rabb, okay? Alameen, like we said, everything in, accepting, in existence. Kullu ma siwa Allahi alam. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman is Rahma to, number one, Ar-Rahman, number one, is a sifa, it's a characteristic of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now we've moved on from praising Allah to now even describing Allah. Allah is now describing Himself. And He calls Himself Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim. He calls Himself Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim. Ar Rahman, okay, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Ar Rahman, Ar Rahman is mercy. But it's the type of mercy that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. So when it comes to Rahman, it's impermissible to call anybody else Ar-Rahman. This is one of those names that's only excuse to Allah. The only way you can call someone Ar-Rahman is if you add it to, to, to the word Abd, Abd Rahman, slave of the most, of the most merciful. Okay? So Abdul Rahman. But Ar-Rahman, okay, Ar-Rahman is, um, it comes from the word Rahma. It comes from the word Rahma, mercy, okay. And it means, يعني, Ar-Rahma ala al-Mubalaga. Severe mer- mercy which you can't even explain. Uncountable amounts of mercy is Ar-Rahman, okay. This is what the word Rahma means. And then after uh, 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 Imam Al-Qurtub, he goes on to explain, أي ذو رحمة الذي الذي لا نظير له فيها the kind of رحمة that there is no one similar to Allah in that kind of رحمة. So if you were to call out to Allah سبحانه وتعالى and say يا الرحمن, you're you're calling for His mercy. This is one of the things that Allah tells us to do that when you call Allah, you call Allah through His names as well. Okay. What does Allah say? ولله الأسماء الحسنى فدعوه. أو فدعه بها. Call him by those names. Call Allah for his name. Say, Ya Rahman, Ar Rahim. Even in the midst of Allah وسلم, when something difficult happened to him, he would say, Ya Hayyu, Ya Qayyum, Bi Rahmatika Astaghim. O Hay, O ever living, O Qayyum, the, the one that supports all things, Bi Rahmatika Astaghim. I'm seeking help for your mercy. So you don't just say, Oh Allah, give me this, give me that. You can say that. But what's better? And what will hopefully, inshaAllah ta'ala, allow you to uh, get your du'a answered and to give du'a in the way that Allah wants is to call Allah through the name that He wants to be called. So we say, Ya Ar-Rahman, Ya Ar-Rahim, okay? So now, if Ar-Rahman means that, Ar-Rahman is for all of the creation. Ar-Rahman is for all of the creation. Ar-Rahim has the same connotation. If I take the most gracious, most merciful. 
Grace and mercy are almost the same thing. Ar Rahim also means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has Rahma. But what we find in the Quran and Sunnah is that Allah uses the word Rahim to, in, to, the, to the Muslims only. You know? So when you ever find Allah saying Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim in the Quran, you constantly hear it being used with, in, in relation to Allah treating the Muslims. So Ar Rahman is for every person, Muslim or Muslim. Because even Allah has Rahma, has mercy to even non Muslims. Okay? Even non Muslims have Rahma from Allah in this dunya anyway. Okay, and from the mercy of that, of, of what Allah has to, to the Muslim, to the non-Muslim, is that anything that a person works hard for in the dunya, they'll receive their reward for it. So even if a non-Muslim tries his best to do something in the dunya, work hard, open a business, so on and so forth, work at a sport or whatever, Allah will give him his reward in the dunya, he will get his reward in the dunya. As for the akhirah, then this kalima of Rahim is only going to be used for the Muslims in, in, in the in the uh, it's, it's going to be used for the Muslims obviously in the dunya as well, but it's exclusively uh, used for giving the Muslims uh, uh, their jaza, their reward in the dunya and in the akhirah. As for Ar Rahman, then it's for it's for all of them, it's for everyone. Okay, and then Allah says, Malik Yawmuddin. Okay, owner, possessor of the day of judgment. Yawmuddin. The day of Ad-Din. Yawmuddin, yani Ad-Din here, Deen, is, deen it has a lot of meanings, as we all know. So, for example, Deen can mean religion. And Yawm Akman to Lakum Deen, Akum this day, I have a theory that Allah says. So, Deen, <coughs> Deen can have many, many connotations. That's the thing in the Arabic language. The Arabic language is very rich. So, like English. So, Deen in the itself, it can have many different connotations. So for example, a religious person, you call him Mutadayyin, but very religious, okay? Um, there's even a, a famous line of poetry, Kama Tudinu Tudan, the way in which you live your life, and the way in your attitude and your methodology of life is the way in which you will be treated. Kama Tudinu Tudan. So Deen even of itself has, has many has many meanings. However, when it comes to the tafsir of the Quran, the Surah Al-Fatiha, when Allah says, Malik Yawm Deen, Master of the Day of Judgment, what's, what's Deen here? It means, uh, it means here, yani, al jaza al al-A'mal, reward for your actions. Okay? Wal hisab, to be held accountable. So Yawm al Qiyamah is that day that a person is going to be held accountable for their deed and they're going to be rewarded. So that's another mas'ala, even, it's, it's not just kalam. It's not the same as that we say. The Muslim has to prepare for Yawm Al-Qiyam. The Muslim has to prepare for this day, Yawm Al-Qiyam. Yawm Al-Qiyam is coming, Shaitan Abayd. Whether we like it or not, Yawm Al-Qiyam is coming. So the question is, what have you put away for Yawm Al-Qiyam? What have you put away for this day? Because this day is a serious day, okay? Yawm Al-Qiyam is a day in which that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala says that Yawm Al-Qiyam is a day in which that a man will flee from his brother. وأمه وأبيه even his mother and his father he will he will he will run away from and there's another thing Allah said about يوم القيامة he said الأخلاء يوم أذن بعضهم لبعض عدو إلا the best friends in the dunya الأخلاء your خليل your أخل your خليل person that you're always with if he, if you're not friends in religiosity in trying to help him in trying to help each other become better Muslims if your if your friends in that which is in disobedience to Allah, Allah says ba'adhum li ba'din On that day, they're going to be enemies. The day, so a friend that's making you do bad, or is a bad friend, on Yawm Al Qiyamah is going to be your enemy. He's not going to be your friend. And then Allah gave an istithna. He gave a he gave a um, an exception. Illa al-muttaqin. Except for those people that they met each other and they know each other for the sake of Allah. They remind each other, they tell each other to do good, they enjoy good, they forbid evil, they tell each other to do good deeds, they remind each other, let's be better Muslim, let's do this, let's do that. If your relationship is at, is is the opposite of that, you're telling each other to do haram, you're making each other do haram, then on Yom Qiyamah that person is going to be your enemy. So even on this, so, so when it comes to deen, jaza, reward, it's very, very important that we as Muslims, we, um, what do you call it? We, we, we really try our best to understand this. And then we go on to say, well then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he goes on to say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we 
uh, uh, worship and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we seek help. Now, if you look, for example, okay, um, uh, if we look at the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke from a grammatical point of perspective, uh, Imam Qurtubi says, قدم المفعول على الفعل احتماما وشأن العرض تقديم الأهم that we say إياك نعبد we could have said in Arabic نعبد يعني نعبدك إياه or something like that we could say we worship you but we said you Allah we worship so we put we, we put the 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 مفعول that which we word the object before the verb you know in Arabic the verb comes before the object the fi'l comes before the mafrul, okay? But here, the object came first. Oh Allah, we worship you. And in the Arabic language, grammatically, and even from a linguistic perspective, this shows al-hasab. It shows exclusivity. The only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person that we, that we worship. And this is why Quraysh, this is why Quraysh had such a problem with what the Prophet they had such a problem with what the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said. Because the, 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 one of the characteristics of the Arabs of Mecca, the pagans of Mecca, was that they were, they were into poetry and they loved language. They would, they would show off with language. They felt as if this was an insult when they heard stuff like this. It made them so angry. What are you talking about? You know, even they said, you know, when, Allah, when the Muslims say, Rahman, Rahman? who's Rahman? What was Rahman to them? They said, what's, what's this Rahman that you're talking about? Who's Rahman? Or when Bilal said, Ahadun Ahad. If you say Ahad, Ahad is, you have the word one in Arabic, you have the word Ahad. Ahad is more exclusive than the word Wahid. So you could have said Wahid, but the fact that even Bilal said Ahad, it was even, it hurt even more. Only one. You're, 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 you're removing anything apart from that. Just a brief, uh, so now. So, 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 so that's what it is. So we're putting the object first, saying, oh Allah, we worship you alone. What's, what's na'budu? What does this mean? Al-ibadah is al-ta'ah, is to obey. So when we say to Allah, iyyaka na'budu, we, we worship me, we obey. Oh Allah, you're the only person, we obey. And there's also a famous hadith, there's two famous hadiths, maybe you guys know. لا طاعة في مخلوق لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق. There is no obedience to the creation if it's in disobedience to who? The Creator. The قاعدة in our religion, a rule. We don't obey no one that tells us to do haram. So if someone says to you, go and steal, go and worship with Allah, worship other than Allah, you don't worship, you don't follow Him. And there's obviously another hadith of Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. لا طاعة في معصية الله. There's no, uh, there's no, uh, there's no obedience in the, in the, in sinning against what Allah, or doing what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said. So a ta'a is to obey Allah, and it's a tadallum. It's tadallum to humble yourself and to bring yourself down to worship Allah. And this is another masala that people have difficulty, especially Muslims in the West. I'll be honest with you. We have a lot of difficulty in understanding this, this masala of tadallum, of humbling ourselves to worship Allah. Because this society, it doesn't teach you to be humble. You're not taught, you're not taught to be virtuous. No one here te te teaches you to be a good character, to be of sound character, to have good akhlaq. They don't teach you that anymore. These things used to be taught, even when this country used to be a Christian country. They taught values, a value system. Your values, respect to our elders. When you're given advice, take the advice. I'm saying, who are you? Who are you to tell me anything? You have kibbutz. We have to understand that as Muslims. We're not anyone that we can't be told anything. No one can tell you anything. No. You understand? We can be told something. You can be put into your place and be told what you're doing is haram, what you're doing is wrong. And if you don't like it, that's your problem. But in al Islam, you can be told, no, what you're doing is wrong. What's the reason behind the Jum'ah, the Jum'ah Salah? The Salah to Jum'ah. It's, it's a congregation every Friday to hear a sermon. Why? To remember, to teach you. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amnu taqullah. Oh people who believe, fear Allah, remember Allah. At least Allah has us once a week we need to hear a sermon. To remind us about the akhirah. Okay? So we have to humble ourselves and realize that we are people that need to be spoken to. And we have to humble ourselves 
to Allah. And what did the Prophet say in the famous hadith? Man tawada'a lillah raf'ahu Allah. Whoever is humble and lowers himself for the sake of Allah, humi- uh, humbles himself and, is, and has humility for the sake of Allah, raf'ahu Allah. Allah will raise him. Allah will raise him. Okay. So you can't find, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense if you find a Muslim trying to be practicing and he's not a kebbir, he's not trying. It doesn't work like that. A Muslim has to be humble, has to be able to take advice, has to be able to take positive criticism, and has to realize if somebody gives you nasih and says what you're doing is haram, what you're doing is wrong, you take the advice. It's not, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a personal thing. Okay? So even when it comes down to ibadah of Allah, we, we pray to Allah, we worship Allah alone, and we accept our faults as human beings. We're not perfect. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to guide us. And then he says, what can nasta'in. And to you, Allah, do we, do we, do we, do we seek al-i'ana, help, help. Obviously, when we say that to Allah, we only receive help. That doesn't mean that you can't, if, you, if you can't carry a bag, you can't ask somebody to help. No. It means that in those things that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do for you, you seek help from Allah. So if a person is praying to Allah to get into Al-Jannah, you don't pray to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and say, Oh Prophet of Allah, take me to Al-Jannah. You only pray to Allah. Allah says, yeah, only Allah can put me into Al-Jannah. Or for example, something supernatural you're asking for, or something in the Akhirah, or you're asking Allah to make you die upon Al-Islam. Husn al to Allah to give you a good end. Oh Allah, make the last words, I say, La ilaha illallah. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, allow me to die upon Al-Islam, for example. You're not going to ask somebody that has no qudra, he has no ability. You're going to ask Allah, you're going to seek help. That's what Allah said, to, uh, what did the Prophet, what did the Prophet Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say to Ibn Abbas, his nephew, who became one of the greatest mufassirun uh, 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 of this ummah, the greatest, one of the greatest scholars of tafsir that we're reading right now. He said, Mithra Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him when he was young, Ya ghulamu inni u'allimuka kalimatin Oh young boy, I'm going to teach you some words Ihfadillah, ihfadillah yahfadah Preserve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Preserve his religion Do what he said and Allah will preserve him Okay And then he went on to go and say in the hadith Wa'idha sa'alta fas'alillah When you ask O Ibn Abbas O Abdullah Ibn Abbas Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala This is coming out of the Prophet's mouth directly and when you seek help, you seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So on those issues that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can help you with, we said we seek help from Allah and Allah only, not horoscopes or, or anything like that. We only seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So then, what's Allah so what's the next ayah in Surah Al Fatiha? Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqeen. Guide us. To the straight path. Let's break down some of the words. Ihdina. Oh Allah, give us guidance. And huda. Huda in Arabic is al irshad, to be guided. It's to be guided. So now we can see that this, 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 uh, this, 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 uh, this prayer that we're saying, we're asking Allah, we're seeking from Allah something. What? Huda. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Oh Allah, guide us to the straight path. So five times a day, a Muslim is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. Five times a day. At the very least, for those who pray the sunnah prayers, even more. They're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. And in the famous hadith Qudsi, the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet Muhammad was quoting Allah in the hadith where he said, Ya ibadi kullukum dalun illa man hadaytuhu. Oh my slaves, you're all dal. You're all misguided. إِلَّا مَنْ هَدَيْتُهُ It's like who have guided. فَاسْتَهْدُونِ أَحْدِكُمْ Seek guidance from me and I'll guide you. So anyone who says, I'm not practicing or I'm not guided, it's because you're not asking Allah. Or you're asking them, you're asking Allah, you ask Allah with a, with a half heart. If whoever truly wants guidance will receive it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah said, فَاسْتَهْدُونِ أَحْدِكُمْ Seek guidance from me and I'll guide him. And in the same hadith, Allah says, Ya ibadi, inni harramtu dhulma ala nafsi, wa ja'altuhu baynakum muharraman fala fadalam. Oh my slaves, I have made oppression haram on myself. 
I will never oppress. So Allah has told us He will never ever oppress. And I have made it between you, oppressing one another, haram. Don't oppress one another. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now in the same place saying, ask me and I'll guide you, that it's from if Allah doesn't guide you, that's oppression. And Allah said it's haram upon himself. So the question a person has to look at, are they truly doing, are they do they truly want what they're asking for? And are they willing to make the sacrifice for what they're asking for? And that's, that's another lesson. Okay. Um, okay. And also when it comes to misguidance as well, a person will only become misguided for their own actions. Allah will never take a Muslim who is sincerely praying to Allah every day for Huda and Allah will just change him like that. No, I have that person doing something behind closed doors or he is he's got some hypocrisy, he thinks that he's cheating the religion and no. And the reason why we know that is because Allah said in the Quran, فَلَمَّا زَاغُوا أَذَاقَ Allah قُرُوبُ when they chose misguidance, then Allah made them become misguided. So when a person chooses to be misguided, he practices Islam, but now he wants to do something else, you know, worship Allah, drink khamar, smoke, commit zina, sleep with then Allah will make him more misguided. But you took the first thing. You did you made that jump and Allah caused you to be misguided. Allah says the Quran, Wala to kunu kaladina nasullah and sam and for soul. Don't be like those people that they forgot Allah and then Allah made them forget themselves. It wasn't Allah who made them forget themselves and then no. They made the conscious decision, we're going to, we don't want this Islam, khalas, we don't want it anymore. Salam alaykum. And then Allah calls them to be misguided. So, ihdina as sirat al mustaqim. What's sirat in the Arabic language? Yani, as sirat is a tariq, it's the path, it's a pathway, as sirat, okay? Al mustaqim. Al mustaqim is a path that has no kind of, um, it doesn't have any kind of, yani, i'wijaj. It doesn't move left or right. It's a straight path that's never changing. Okay? So it's a path that It doesn't bend this way, it doesn't bend that way. The Sirat al Mustaqim is one way and one way only for every single person. To believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to never can associate partners with him in worship. To pray fast the daily prayers. To give zakat, to fast in the month of Ramadan, to make hajj, and it's easy. It's not one rule for one person, one rule for, for someone else. Islam is easy and can be done. And we even know this from a aqli perspective, from a, from, from a perspective of just logic. If, if everyone in your household is praying, you know, if one person is not praying, then the problem is with you. Or if a hundred people are able to pray salah, pray to wake up for fajr in the morning, for example, and you're the one that can't, then you're the anomaly. And there's no, we don't, the, 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 what was happened is we have the majority, you can't be the anomaly. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided us to that which is possible. The question is, is the person willing to make that sacrifice? So Sirat al Mustaqim, okay, Sirat al Mustaqim is the straight path. And what is that straight path? What's it talking about? It's the straight path of the, of the prophets. Of the of, 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 of the prophets, of the uh, of the shuhada, of the martyrs, and of the siddiqeen, those two that had the highest form of faith. Because Allah says, "Wa yuti Allah wa Rasul, faulaika ma'aladina an am Allah alayhi min nabiyin wa siddiqeen wa shuhada wa salihin wa hasuna ulaika rafiqa." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says that indeed, whoever okay obeys Allah and His Messenger. فَأُولَٰئِكَ Then they are مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ Then he's from those people that Allah has given his ni'mah, his favor, his bounty upon. مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ Okay. Um, from the prophets. وَالصِّدِّقِينَ Those people that have the highest form of iman. They're not prophets, but they're pious Muslims. Very pious. وَالشُّهَدَاء Those people that martyred. وَالصَّالِحِينَ الصَّالِحِ is good Muslims. He's a good Muslim. Yeah. He's not a Siddiq. Not the level of being a Siddiq, but being a Salih is still, it's a, still good, it's a good position to be in. Okay? And then I said, then Allah said, وَحَسُنَا أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا يعني, And all those people, what a great assembly to be in if you're amongst those, amongst those people. 
And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, Naam, oh, so Naam, so that's Sirat al ladina Naamta Alayhim Afwa. That's the ayah. The path that you have given, Sirat al ladina Naamta Alayhim. So this Sirat, the Sirat al Mustaqeen, is a Sirat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given His favor upon. So we say, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqeen. Guide us to that path, and that path is a path that Allah has given His favor to. And we just said that they are the Nabiyyeen, Sifiqeen, Shuhada, As-Salihin. All those good, yani good, good Muslims, yani, okay? Good, pious Muslims. And a Muslim is striving. Striving Muslim. And then Allah says, غَيْرُ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِينَ Okay? Um, not those people that have the anger of Allah, the ghadab. And some of us say that the that the, the, the ghadab of Allah. Number one, before we break the sound, so we'll have like a disclaimer. Uh, we're reading from classical Islamic texts. We are not anti any Muslims. <coughs> so we're not anti Christian. We're not anti Jew. We're not anti Hindu. We we disagree with them, but we're not. If you like, uh, we don't support any attacks or any bombing or. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? We're looking at something from a not logical, from a religious perspective, but we're not violent. We're not saying that, oh, because, for example, we disagree with other other uh, religions, that we are saying we have to now kill someone. No, we're not saying that. So, when I'm under, so, so, so what I'm trying to say is that, as a general principle, as a Muslim, we believe that Allah is happy with Muslims, and I'm happy with disbelievers, for example. But not only that, Allah can be unhappy with the Muslims if they do haram. But when Allah says Sirat al ladina anta alayhim ghayri maghdubi alayhim Then the ulama say that the maghdubi alayhim are the Yahud, are the Jews Who Allah has the anger upon Because of obviously in the Quran they killed the prophets They killed, uh, they tried to kill Isa alayhi salam They killed Zakariya And obviously the other prophets that they killed And they even tried to kill obviously the Prophet of Allah alayhi salam With the rock And the Dalim are the people who are, so you have the maghdubi alayhim The people that the qadr, the anger of Allah is upon and then you have the dal misguided. The ulama say this is the nasar. Why is why uh, why does Allah call the Jews maghubi alayhim and the nasara wa dalim? Because the nasara, the sight more innocent, they are very soft in their religion, and they're very sincere. And nasraniya, if I can just have everyone's attention, nasraniya is not like Islam and Judaism. Islam and Judaism, there's a focus on ilm, of knowledge. How to pray, how to ahkam. Christianity he doesn't have that. It's just all laughing in the church, jumping up and down, that's all. The Jews have a lot of knowledge. Nobody can deny that. Whoever's going to talk, Akhi, the Jews are very clever people. The majority of Nobel Prize winners are the Jews. Are, Allah has blessed them in that way. Whether you like or not, Allah has blessed them with aql. They're, both, they're very intelligent people. And even when it comes to their religion, religion, they practice their religion. However, they have a lot of information. And one of the things that they know is they know that a prophet is going to come to them. And they know what's not going to be from Bani Israel. They know that. They know this. So even though they know this, they choose to not follow the best of Allah. And this is why we believe that they incur the wrath of Allah. On the other side, the Christian. The Christian is a scheme. They still commit shirk with Allah, they say Allah the Son, but it's just love, 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 God is love, God, Jesus is love, I love Jesus, Jesus loves Jesus. And he has, and everything is love. So it's, it's, they're, they're two different sides. They're both disbelief, but even disbelief, even disbelief, there's tafawut, there's darajah. The same way a goodness, there's darajah. Some people they're good in one way, some people they're, there's different levels of even goodness, even in evil, there's different levels of, of disbelief. Some people they are. They, they have no problem with you. Some people they hate you. They hate what you're upon. So this is basically this is basically it, okay? And abdal, what's dal? Abdalal is misguided. But in, in the Arabic language, how can dalal be ex- expressed? Abdalal fi kalam al Arab. In the Arabic language, dalal means quod the hab and sunan al qasd. It's for you to move away from that which you should be upon. The good way that you should be upon. Which is al al istiqama. You have dalal to not go in that direction. We don't go in that direction. That's misguided. Of dalal, okay. Um, okay, now. So now, 
So that's basically what it means. And then obviously at the end, we say, well, Abdali, Ameen. Ameen in the Arabic language, it means Allahumma istajib, or oh, Allah answer, answer. So when you say Ameen in the Salah, you say, oh Allah, answer what we're saying. Um, and obviously we know the hadith where the Messenger of Allah said, if the Imam says, well, if, if the Imam says Ameen, say Ameen as well. It's a delete. That Amin should say out loud. The majority of the, uh, the Muslim, the Madahib, the Hanbalis, Shafi'is, and Malikis, they say Amin out loud. Those the Hanafi, they say low, but they still say it anyway. But yeah, and that's one of the, that's one of the, that's one of the, that's one of the adilla that we should say it out loud. But anyway, this is basically a brief description of Surah Al Fatiha. There's no way uh, on earth I'm able to give the topic is how. Because Surah the Quran, every time you read it, you learn something more. Every time the Alim explains it, there's another. There's, yani, it's something which keeps. There's more and more gems come out of the Quran. So, inshallah Taala, we're gonna open the door for questions. And whether that's questions on the topic or other related topics, inshallah Taala, faliyat al-fadl, al-fadl. Now. So. Uh, uh, maybe you know about, I've heard in another tafsir of mm. Fatiha, a sirat, mm -hmm. something to do with vertical ascension. Mm -hmm. So, do you know anything about that? Sirat. I've never heard of that one. I don't know. Maybe we can research that now. Yeah. Uh, I have heard uh, about a hadith, uh, I don't know if it's sahih, uh, that says the Prophet said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that I have divided fat Fatiha in two parts. Is yes. there anything? Yes, I'll go on. Carry on. Uh, I don't know uh, a lot about this hadith. I mean, is there the hadith about like uh, the the conversation talking about like the, the Muslims in a conversation with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? No, it's hadith. It's hadith. Okay. No. No one has any other questions? Yes, Fadl. Uh, uh, how can a layman uh, learn Arabic, the classical Arabic in uh, the West? I've studied it. There's many books in how to learn Arabic. You have, for example, the best book that most people study is. The Medina books, her Medina books, and the Russian Lugal Arabia Lirayli Natakina Biha. Lessons in Arabic for non native speakers. That's a good start. Um, and then from there, you know, you can study Medina book one, Medina book two, Medina book three, and then obviously maybe you start to chat, kind of um, read and explore and try your best, you know, um, to, 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 to gain a, a strong vocabulary. You can study abroad, you go to Egypt for a few months and different countries where it's like an open society, you can learn. So there's many, many ways. Which a person can can learn the Arabic language. The Arabic language is easy to learn. Whoever wants to learn, inshallah Taala, can learn the Arabic language. If 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 your niyyah is for is for the sake of Allah to learn the, to learn it, Allah will give you the tawfiq to learn. You learn it, inshallah Taala. So um, there's online classes. You've got different institutes. I think even down the road, we've got Badal Badal Institute. Um, they they're good. They 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 teach Arabic. You know, so you've got you've got many different reality places where you can benefit and learn the Arabic language now. Um, I know there's a particular condition, but you see, like, like you're saying, the best one was the best one. Uh, is there more authentic opinion than you can say or not? Well, there are different opinions on whether or not Bismillah rahman rahim You talk about the best one, Bismillah. Yeah, there's some ulama that say it's from Fatiha, some ulama say it's not an ayah from Fatiha, but what the ulama is agreeing with is it's an ayah from the Quran, but whether or not it's an ayah from Fatiha is an issue, is a, is a mess of khilaf. Um, I personally don't have a view on it, I haven't looked into the mess too too much, but now there's both of opinions have their validity. So now nah. any other people have questions? No one has questions? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
it's preferred. It's not wajib that you do it. It's not. It's not wajib. So, for example, you might be walking on the street and just to say when no or something like that. It's It's not wajib. So now, so some, so, so it's not wajib. But can you do it in the prayer? Some ulama say you can do it in the prayer. And but generally speaking, it's, it's applied to outside of the outside of the prayer as well. Now, yeah. Um, do the sisters have questions, or is there like do people want to write down on paper or now? Nah. You say, I said, Allah, 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 I said, I'm the Muhammad Rasulullah. I said, bear witness that there's no word or God worthy of worship except Allah, and that the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is his messenger, and the person is Muslim now. Do you need witness for it? No, you don't need the witness at all. And you don't have to bring the person in front of the Imam, and then after he says, I said, when he cut from, I said, I'm just saying. It could be a private affair, you know, because sometimes it's almost like they. Turn into like a freak show, everyone. and it's, it's good. Some people like it, some, you know. But then after it can be an issue because the person next to Shahada, everyone goes around him, and then after everyone just says, like, "Okay, yeah, you're on your own now. Here's, here's ten thousand bucks, salam alaykum. And uh, yeah, just just yeah, just don't come and go after nine nine p.m. Yeah, that's it. Give you everything. We've given you everything that we don't read ourselves, by the way. So we also, we never read this stuff. It's been in our, it's been you know my dad's cabinet for twenty five years. You have been, you read it, you practice, and salam alaykum. Nah, nah, Person, and you can give shahada. Um, a person can be there to say, Oh, no, no. A person who doesn't pray, is he a kafir? Or? A person who doesn't pray, is he considered a non Muslim? Um, there are different some opinions. Number one, some people say that a person who doesn't pray, is he considered a non Muslim or not? Number one, we're all in agreement that praying, not praying for salah is dangerous. Um, does a person, so the question is, the, the khilaf comes in, who who is considered a tariq salah Who is considered a lever of the prayer? Is it a person who leaves one prayer and is just lazy? Or is it a person who leaves it in kulliya? The ulama are generally speaking are unanimous agreement that a person who leaves off prayer in totality, meaning 355, 365 days of the year, he never prays salah, is considered to be a non-Muslim. That's, that's what everyone says, because he's not praying at all. However, some ulama, they say that, okay, what about the, the state of most people who don't pray, which is they pray sometimes, they don't pray other times, they're lazy. Um, most of the scholars are of the opinion that he's a Muslim. That's the majority of scholars. Classical. Maybe if you might hear from now other scholars who say that he's not, or he's not a Muslim. The classical scholars are of the opinion that a person who doesn't pray salat out of laziness and prays it sometimes or not, he's still considered a Muslim because Allah said in the Quran, إن الله لا يغفر أن يشرك به ويغفر ما دون ذلك لمن يشاء. Allah will never forgive a person who dies upon shirk, who dies upon praying to other than Allah, and will forgive any single thing apart from that to whom He will. So based upon that, they say that He is considered a Muslim. That's that's the opinion that I take because um, even if we were to take that opinion that. The person who doesn't pray out of laziness is not a Muslim. That was when the ulama were talking about when Islam had power and everyone was praying. This hal that we live in now, Muslims are weak, Muslims have knowledge of the religion. There's many issues why people don't pray. It's not some people don't even they're embarrassed. They don't want to mention because they don't know how to do wudu and they're embarrassed. Even when they don't have subhanahu wa ta'ala, they got to make this noise in the salah because they're so embarrassed. So not, so there's many things why a person doesn't pray. So I personally have the opinion that a person doesn't pray out of laziness. He's a Muslim, inshallah. Now, a person who says who only prays on Fridays is that the Friday? Like I said, the person who doesn't leave it in totality, I believe him to be a, a Muslim. And that's what. That, I mean, we don't want to start calling. We don't want to get this issue of takfir and who's a Muslim, who's not a Muslim, because that itself is a slippery slope. Now, do we have any more questions? And just by the way, after the talk, I'm not going to be able to answer questions. That's what I'm trying to say. Everyone just answer them here. It's not going to be a thing where like I'm going to stand outside for 20 minutes and nah. The whole point. Hi. Next one. You said that uh, those people who, who choose to make the wrong decision are rather misguided. So as Muslims, we come across questions where people refuse to take responsibility and say that, but isn't it already... Yeah. Nah, so how can we respond to something like that? You can say that, for example, um, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your destiny, Allah knows your ultimate destiny, but that doesn't negate the fact that you have free will. And it's a very difficult concept to ask. Even the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, he told the companions, what this, this issue of qadr is something that people never understand. What is Muslim? Because when, look, this is another thing. Sometimes we have to understand as Bani Adam, as the children of Adam, our aql is, our, our brains, we're not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can't comprehend everything. Our comprehension is limited. So we cannot comprehend how can a person have destiny and is predestined to end up in the hellfire or not, yet he has free will. It's, it's, it, it, it's not something which is easy to understand. What we understand is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given every single person free will. And Allah knows the decision that that person will take. Okay? And Allah knows whether or not this person is going to, what do you call it, do actions that are going to take to the Alpha or do actions that are going to take to Jannah. But a person cannot say, oh, it's Qadr that I'm just like this. There are some people that could have an excuse, for example, a person in an Amazon rainforest. He's never, or even Christians in Europe in the Middle Ages, يعني, you know, miskeen, like, he's going, you know, giving money, all of his money to the Pope, like back in the day, when, you know, before the Renaissance and all of that. Miskeen, يعني, he's never heard about Islam. And he doesn't even know, just a few miles away in the Sahara area, and he, it's Jannah for the Muslims at the time anyway, it was lovely, peaceful. And then in Europe, they just give each other, smash each other's heads, and they would live in hell. I can't imagine they were living in hell. The Muslims, mashallah, it was seven al asal, as they say. Um, so, what we'll say is that on your al Qiyamah, number one, everyone's going to have a chance to express themselves in front of Allah about, obviously, their life. As for here and right now, we can say to a person, if you want to drink this water, you have the choice to drink it or not. If I now go and take a sip of this water, can I say I was forced or I'm majboor, I have to do it? No. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me free will. As for Allah knowing what I'm going to do, then Allah knows if I'm going to drink that water or not. He knows the decision that I'm going to take. But I still have free will. And a person, this is what I'm trying to say, a person uses it to, um, as an answer for their, like you said, bad deeds. I think it's because it's qadr. Then, you can say that for anything. So now, you have been given responsibility as a Muslim, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will know the outcome of the decision. Allah knows the outcome of the decision that you have made now. I think you had a hand up for a question. Yes. You have that question. I know yeah, you have a question. Well, how can how can someone humble and humbles their sem- themselves in salah? Hum in salah. In salah. In just salah. Salah. Um. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, by okay. Well, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he was asked by Jibril, "فأخبرني uh, عن uh, الإحسان." Tell me about Ihsan. Ihsan is a very high level of iman, and the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, said. أن تعبد الله كأنك تراه فإن لم تكن تراه فإنه يراك to worship Allah as if you to worship Allah as if you see him كأنك تراه فإن لم تكن تراه فإنه يراك and if if you can't worship Allah as if you can see him then know that he sees you so try your best to worship Allah just remember that you're standing in front of Allah and that just think about Allah's greatness think about what you're saying you're praising Allah that this is the same prayer that the Muslim of Allah used to do and inshallah ta'ala you pray but just try to be tranquil in your prayer just pray being tranquil don't, don't pray and think how do I get for sure no just, 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 just pray and you pray and pray and just think about the akhirah and do you understand because then that's going to open the west west door of oh, and then and then that's another monster is created na'am at the back brother you are oh, just a sister at the question at the back of that. Sisters don't sisters don't have to say Amin, they can just say it like they can utter it, but they don't say it loud like the men. Nah, nah. Yes, Akhir Khirim. Uh, I think we touched on a really Pardon me, sorry? I think we touched okay, on nah, nah. but someone on our live said uh, that they heard that so Oh yeah, you got us from the land, nah, nah, someone nah. They said that uh, they heard some of the the conversation of Allah. It's where true. We be able to study, where would we be able to study both sides of this conversation? You can maybe find it in books of tafsir, you can find the hadith. If you just write in, you know, Fatiha conversation with Allah hadith, you can find it. But now, I'm not sure of any word specific program, but no, there's a hadith that, that, that Allah talks back to you. When you say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Allah says, My slave has praised me, and things like that. So now, but 
but I don't know where, like, unless you find the hadith and its explanation, uh, I don't know of any courses about that, like, unless you ask a shaykh or something like that. Like. Go ahead, go ahead. They said, uh, how will we know if we're truly to say it in there and pray up? Or is that only known on judgment day? If you're doing something for the Prophet already said, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالْنِيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مِرِئِ مَا نَوَى Actions are by intention, and for every person it's what they intended. فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِلَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ No, فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَمِنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِدُنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا أَوْ مَرَأَةٍ يَمْكِرُهَا هِجْرَتُهُ يَا مَا هَدْرَ يَدْ Person that actions are by intention for every single person what they intended. Whoever uh, uh, made hijrah, talking about in the time when they had to migrate to, to Medina, he said, whoever migrated to Medina for Allah and his blessing, then it's been his intentions for that. وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِدُنْيَا Whoever leaves, uh, whoever migrates for the sake of the dunya, or to marry a woman, then his, 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 his reward is for that which he intended. So you in your heart, you know that if you're doing it for the sake of Allah or not. That's it. Now, you may be praying salat. You could be praying salat, and uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, 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 a person, um, you could be praying salat, and a person, maybe he notices another person come in. He notices maybe another person come in, or something like that. And now he feels as if, oh no, I'm praying because that person's here, or something like that. No, no, the ulama, they say, if that happens, just try to concentrate and, and remind us you're praying for Tikkun Allah, and push away that whisper that you get and carry on. So, one of the things that the shaitan will do, which I have to tell you, you're not sincere. No, if you're doing something for the sake of Allah, I'm doing this, inshallah, it's an action I'm doing because it's a sunnah, I'm doing because Allah's pleased with it, I'm doing this to get to Jannah, inshallah, it's an act of sincerity, inshallah. Now, yeah. Is it also, just to add on to that, if, if you do more in private, that can help with your uh, relaxing your. The relaxing now. So do more uh, good deeds in private, giving charity in private, doing zikr of Allah in private, praying in private, and anything you can do in private that will, uh, what do you call it? Will, um, nah, will, will give you ikhlas. Nah. But if you, but, but having ikhlas doesn't mean that, um, as long as you do something for the sake of Allah, and you're trying to get to Al Jannah, you're trying to please Allah, you're mukhlis, inshallah, you have the class now. Right? The moral. Yeah, the question is, what more? Someone said, uh, what is the correct methodology to follow? Well, that, that's a, that, what does he mean though? What do you mean in that? That's what you're talking about. I need to follow the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his sunnah, that's it. It's simple. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Alaikum bisunnati wa sunnati al Khulafa al Rashidin. You know, to follow, to follow what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam followed. So you just follow the Prophet and his companions, you know? لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسْنًا And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a listening down. So you follow the Prophet, his companions, what they did, and خلاص, that's what we follow. We follow the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We follow the Sunnah, that's it. You know, we follow what he did in his lifetime. Because you don't, you don't, you don't want to base your religion on what happens after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died. So maybe some different groups will base their religion on what happened after the death of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But after the death, that, that's now open to different interpretation. What did the Prophet do when alive? Our religion is based on what the Prophet did when he's alive. So when, for example, we don't eat alcohol, we don't drink alcohol, we don't drink it because the Prophet ﷺ told us not to do it in life. But the Prophet ﷺ told us not to eat pork because it's not doing that. When the Prophet ﷺ told us not to consume riba. Yeah, and we do what the Prophet told us to do when he's alive. We don't build our religion upon what happened after his death. For now. Okay, that's it. Any more questions? Uh, yes. Do you need to keep the karma before like, on your own? No, you'd have to give the karma now. You'd have to give the karma now. Any more questions, inshallah ta'ala? Should we end it there now? Yes. Pardon me, sir? Say we have all of our addictor needs in check, like we're fulfilling them. How do we go about, like, what do we do next? Um, how do we seek further knowledge? Where do you suggest we start? Oh, you're talking about knowledge? A person when you seek knowledge, the first thing you have to understand is the most important knowledge is obviously understanding your Lord. So the first thing a person needs to understand is understanding who Allah is. Who is Allah that you're praying to? If you don't know who you're praying to, then you're going to be in a problem. So learning Tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a good book to read is, for example, Mabad al Tawheed, the fundamentals of Tawheed by Dr. Amina Bilal Phillips. Very good book. Comprehensive good book on who Allah is. Why do we worship him and what is considered worship? 
So, uh, I'd say that book, The Fundamentals of Tawheed by Bilal Phillips. It's only about five pounds, five, six pounds. It's about 100 pages. So, you finish it in like a day or two. Um, nah, you know. So, 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 nah. So, nah, Bilal Davis, Bilal, da not Bilal Davis, Bilal Phillips, have one. Bilal Phillips, Fundamentals of Tawheed. So, read about who Allah is. You know, and then from there, learn your, you know, learn how to pray properly and, and all these other things, and you know, khalas. From there, you, you, you know, you, it will, it will, it will set off a, if you like, a, a, a um, snowball effect. Once you read that book, then you will learn about other books. And but I'll say that is a very good book for Muslim and non-Muslim on what Islam is and why we worship Allah and what Tawheed is, because Tawheed is the worship of Allah alone, right? What does Allah always tell us? Don't associate partners with Allah. So shirk is the biggest sin that a Muslim can do. And shirk is to worship other than Allah. So to pray to the grave, to make dua to other than Allah, to do maybe like to bow down to another person, to bow down to a grave, to ask a person in the grave, to think that a, a to ask saints rather than ask Allah. So all these things they commit, they're considered shirk. So in order for you to understand what Tawheed is, you need to understand what Shirk is, and that book tackles that. Because one of the biggest problems, there's many problems that the Ummah has, but one of the biggest issues we have now that was not around in time of Allah is this issue of Shirk, of worshipping other than Allah, going to graves uh, and having superstitious beliefs. So for example, like if you go to Turkey or go to like the Kabab shops or anything, you have that blue thing, that blue eye thing. And people think that the blue eye gives you protection. Or that a talisman, a talisman will be And it's nothing in the Sharia that tells us this. That's relying upon other than Allah. So we need to clear out those kind of things. And inshallah ta'ala, Allah, Allah, you know, from there, inshallah, there's other books, inshallah, you can, you can read. But I say that's the most important one to read. Now, yes. When are you going to come back to give us more tips? <laughs> Soon, inshallah ta'ala, hopefully, inshallah ta'ala. It's a long journey. So, and, and some, you know, some brothers, mashallah, they, they, uh, they picked me up VIP styles and Allah subhanahu wa So, I, I, I think that that's something that, that hopefully I can, uh, okay, inshallah, we'll, we'll, we'll sort something out, inshallah. We'll sort something out, inshallah. Okay, inshallah, I think we'll end it there. Uh, Jazakallah khair for everyone for coming. And uh, it's funny because last time I actually came here was 2011. There was actually an event in the Brunel. And actually, okay, my friend, we actually used to study at Rabbi Kuduli. So now, nah, so Zakhlaq Khay, and uh, inshallah, we will uh, see each other next time, inshallah. We need that company, we need to be in that. Okay.